So I woke up today and I found out that Dave Mustaine was going to be on Rogan. So I got really excited because I've heard Dave do interviews before, you know, even some extended interviews that went a while, but Joe likes to do three hour podcasts sometimes. So I thought this is going to be insane to hear Dave Mustaine speaking freeform and uh, just doing an interview for three hours. I thought this is either going to be really interesting or really depressing because sometimes when you hear somebody who you really like talk for a long period of time, you either find out that they're actually kind of boring or they're not really what you thought they were. Uh, so I was really anticipating this interview to see. After listening to the entire three hour interview, it was really exciting because I found out a whole bunch of things that I never knew about before. And uh, sure, they may have talked about it in the past, you know, maybe some other interviews or articles or whatever, but for some reason I missed some of these things. So I thought I would make this video to showcase the top 15 things that I found very interesting uh, when I listened to this podcast with Dave Mustaine. The first thing's more of just something I noticed, it's really weird, but uh, if you listen to Dave's voice now when he's talking, he sounds a lot like Casey Kasem. I don't know if you know who that is. If you're younger, you might not know. But he was always on the radio when I was a kid doing the countdown of the top hits. Listen to Casey Kasem's voice and then listen to Dave's and I think you'll agree. Dear Casey, this may seem to be a strange dedication request. The thing was, is, um, you know, the guy was keeping several members of the band sick. I found out that Dave Mustaine actually started martial arts really early in life, kind of like I did. He started at age 12 and he was studying karate and taekwondo, uh, even training with a guy named Benny the Jet or quit is, I don't really know how to pronounce that, but uh, a world renowned fighter. And he didn't just stop there. He got his black belt in Taekwondo, his black belt in karate, but he went on later in his life, kind of like me, to get into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is a very difficult art. There's a lot of grappling involved. It really tears at your body. So doing it in, at an older age is uh, very risky. So I always respect people who take that chance. I'm not saying it just because I did, but uh, just knowing how tough of a martial art that is, it's really respectable that Dave Mustaine would get into it in his later years. And now I guess he's a purple belt. It only took him four years to get it. I think he said three or four years where it took me over 10. So uh, hats off to him. Dave said that he wants skydived, is that correct? It might be skydove, I'm not really sure, with Patrick Swayze, which is huge. You know, when I grew up, he was one of the biggest stars ever. And of course, his huge role in Roadhouse is uh, kind of what they were discussing on the podcast. And so I thought that was really interesting, not only to imagine Dave Mustaine skydiving, but uh, skydiving with Patrick Swayze, that's wild. If you're a big MMA fan, you probably remember the old pride fights that they had in Japan back in the day. And the fighter who uh, was dominating everybody at one time was named Mark Kerr. And there's a whole documentary on him called The Smashing Machine. It's a really interesting documentary and a really sad one at the same time, but I highly recommend it if you're into MMA at all. And I guess at one time, Mark Kerr lived with Dave Mustaine. I thought that was really insane. If you see a picture of Mark Kerr, he's this giant Hulk looking guy. And uh, I guess one day Dave's wife came upstairs in the middle of the night to get something out of the fridge and he was in the cupboards trying to find candy or something like that. I thought that'd be quite the sight to see in the middle of the night, you know. Dave said that early on, he really was only influenced by a few bands because he didn't have exposure to many. So whatever his parents were playing, it was a lot of the old classics, a lot of the popular songs. But it wasn't until his sister's boyfriend introduced him to bands like Deep Purple, Mott the Hoople, David Bowie, uh, I think he said Kiss and Led Zeppelin as well, that he really started to get into the heavier side of music. I thought that was really interesting because when I was a kid, my parents would play Elvis and, uh, you know, just the early, uh, early rock and roll uh, CCR type stuff. And I loved it, but it wasn't until my cousin introduced me to Kiss that I really took off uh, loving heavy metal music. So I love making these parallels with Dave just because uh, it's kind of cool to see that we've had similar backgrounds. And uh, I always love to see what gets people into the heavier side of music. Another similarity is that we both started off with uh, being self-taught with guitar. I later on went on to get formal instruction, but he never really did until much later on. And when he did, he said that his guitar teacher actually made guitar more confusing for him. And since he already knew how to express himself on the guitar, he felt like he didn't want to confuse himself with uh, all these new ideas that this teacher was bringing him. Uh, he also said, though, for a lot of people, lessons are the way to go. It's just that he went so far without them that uh, it was actually hurting him more than helping him. I guess when Dave was really young, he was a Jehovah's Witness because that's what his family was. But uh, later on, he rejected it. And then uh, it took him quite a long time, but he eventually became a born-again Christian. 
So it's kind of funny when you listen to Megadeth's lyrics, especially the early days, you could really kind of see his uh, rebellious side when it comes to religion in a lot of his lyrics. But uh, I thought that was really interesting that he came full circle and now he's kind of doing it a different way uh, with the born again Christian side of things. He talked about his longest tour and he said that it was 72 weeks long. And that's so crazy if you think about it. I went on a tour once that lasted one week and I was already homesick and uh, I just felt like I wanted to uh, go back to my old life. You know, it just felt so crazy every night being in a van and going to another city. So 72 weeks, I can't even imagine what that was like. And I believe that must have been for Killing Is My Business because he talked about later on, they went back to the studio and started on Peace Cells. So that kind of makes sense chronologically. Now, a lot of us know that Dave's guitar parts ended up in Kill Em All. He wrote a lot of the songs and then even Ride the Lightning. But he mentioned that a few of his riffs actually ended up on Master of Puppets, the album. And I did a little research and there's a, there's talk that Leper Messiah actually includes some of Dave's work. And, uh, you know, Dave keeps saying that he's over it and then he's like, ah, oh, it's no big deal. I'm not bitter about it. But you can always kind of tell there's a little tinge of bitterness when he talks about the early Metallica days. I didn't know this, but Dave actually played on the Jimi Hendrix Experience concert. I think it was called Experience Hendrix. And it was really funny because they showed a clip of him playing his signature V, but with Jimi Hendrix design on it. And uh, I guess Dweezil Zappa had to go in and kind of uh, mess with his tone a little bit because it was too metal possibly. And he tried to make it sound a little bit more like a Hendrix tone. And Dave said that he hated it because he's not used to that, but he had to admit that it did sound good for the uh, occasion. Oh, by the way, I'm holding this white V because of Dave. Obviously it kind of fits the video topic, but uh, you know, I'm probably not gonna play it today, but I feel more comfortable holding a guitar probably from teaching for so many years. But uh, yeah, that's why I have the V. Speaking of Dave rebelling against his uh, early upbringing in the Jehovah's Witnesses, he was talking about how he got into black magic because he said his sister got into white magic. And so Dave talked about uh, the song The Conjuring actually including lyrics that can teach you how to do some sort of manifestation through black magic. But he said it's not a complete recipe, so don't try to do it. But uh, he said he used some black magic on two people. And that the first guy that he tried it on was like a bully and he ended up breaking the bully's leg, he says, with whatever curse he did. And then the second person I thought was really funny because as he was describing it, I'm like, this sounds a lot like Stranger Things, kind of like an Eddie Chrissy type of situation. He was like, yeah, this really popular girl from high school uh, came over and wanted to buy drugs. So I'm like, oh, this sounds a little familiar, you know, but then it changes, you know, directions. He's like, and I put a sex hex on her. And next thing I know, I wake up and uh, he alluded to that they were together the night before, but he never really confirmed it. He kind of made it sound ambiguous, I think, on purpose. So he said that James once lived with Ron McGovney, which I believe I knew about from a long time ago. I read that somewhere. But after they kicked Ron out of the band, James moved in with Dave and his mom. So Dave was living with his mom in a tiny place, I guess, and James ended up living with them. And he and Dave had to share a bedroom. I thought that was hilarious because I thought of like two young brothers fighting with each other all the time, especially because he said that the bedroom was really small. He said it was the size of Joe's desk. So just trying to imagine that. And then he said that they would just drink vodka all the time and then go driving and it was usually foggy where they were living. And so he said, if we would have done that a few more times, we may have crashed and just died because it was such a dangerous, volatile situation with the vodka and with the fog and all that stuff. And I thought about it, I'm like, you know what? Imagine what metal would be like today if the two kings of metal, in my opinion, James and Dave, died in a car accident back in the day. It's kind of one of those weird things I don't really want to think about, but it's kind of interesting to fathom, I guess. Because Dave has been headbanging so much his whole life, he actually ended up getting a degenerative uh, disc disease. That's hard to say, DDD. And he actually had to get surgery on it because it was starting to affect his neck as far as the nerves went. Uh, he couldn't really move his neck. And he said that he was about to play a concert with the Big Four, with Metallica, and uh, he had to get emergency surgery. And he called Metallica's manager and Metallica's manager called him a wimp or something like that. I forgot exactly the exact words. But uh, so Dave ended up getting, I think, a shot, maybe a cortisone shot, got through the concert, afterwards went and got surgery on his neck. And he actually had to put a bunch of notes all around his microphone that said, don't headbang. And uh, he said it's because, you know, you might get excited it's a live concert and forget that you're injured and start headbanging and just make it all worse. So after that, he ended up getting the surgery. This kind of blew my mind. This will be the last one. But Dave is actually very technologically adept. 
he uh, had one of the first websites ever. He talked about a website called Megadeth Arizona, and he said he had it way back in like 94. And uh, it was he, they were so advanced that he said Gene Simmons from Kiss actually called him up and he was like, I, we need to have one of those things for our band. So I guess they were, you know, one of the first bands to actually have a website. And then he went on now to uh, get into VR. He's talking about NFTs. And it's kind of inspiring for me to see someone older like Dave still into technology and is actually on the forefront of it. He's really thinking of doing some VR technology. I think they already have a little bit where they're going to actually play a concert and make it like a 3D experience where you could wear VR, a VR headset and see all the different angles of the show just from sitting in one seat and eventually just watching it from home if you want to. So yeah, so those are the 15 interesting things that I learned today from listening to Dave talk for three plus hours. Uh, I still recommend you listen to the entire podcast because there are a lot of things that I didn't mention. Uh, I just wanted to keep it down to 15 things. You start getting into like 20 or 30 details. Nobody really wants to hear all those. So uh, I totally recommend checking out the entire Joe Rogan podcast. Okay, everyone, thanks for watching and we'll catch you at the next video. Bye.